Today I will be talking about Central Asia. Central Asia is the poorest region in Europe and former Soviet Union. Poorest but, but the most beautiful. I think we have, we have several students, participants from Central Asia and, uh, and you will comment my presentation but please don't comment numbers because these numbers which I will present are not from my head, they are from international sources. So probably you will know different numbers, but these numbers are also relevant. I will be talking about Central Asia based on, and this information which I will present to you, will be based on the huge project which we had, which we completed three years ago. It was about Central Asian Human Development Report on Cooperation in Central Asia. This was a huge exercise which involved more than 100 people, including Sharbanu. She was responsible for one of the chapters. So let's start this. Okay, so first I will talk about Central Asia and in general and key challenges, and then about the number of issues trade, transport and transit, water and energy and environment, natural disasters, drugs, crime and terrorism, social development challenges, and political and institutional constraints. At the end, we will just come to certain conclusions and recommendations for different parties. Okay, Central Asia. Central Asia is just the region located in the middle of the Euro-Asian continent. When we are talking, when we are referring to Central Asia, we usually have in mind five Central Asian countries, former Soviet republics, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan. Sometimes you can find, you know, in some different books, uh, different classifications. Sometimes people include also Azerbaijan or Mongolia or Afghanistan to Central Asia. Sometimes, especially in Russia, in former Soviet Union, people say Central Asia and Kazakhstan. So they exclude Kazakhstan from Central Asia. But according to our classification and our understanding of what Central Asia is, these are the these five, central, five former Soviet Republic, republics located in Central Asia. This region, as you see, this was just at the end of former Soviet Union. Saying the end of former Soviet Union, I have in mind that this region was close to the border with China, Iran, Afghanistan. These borders during Soviet time were completely closed. You could not close, cross these borders. So this region was very isolated from the rest of the world. And this situation was until the end of 80s or beginning of 90s. Then, in 1991, transition started. So the new countries were created in this area. But the interest of the world, general world to this region, was very limited. But the situation changed after September 11, after this new wave of the war with the terrorists. And still, there is a certain attention, especially related to human rights issues, democracy, some military issues, American and Russian uh, military bases in, in, in these countries, and so on. If you look on the borders in Central Asia, they are very, very complicated. Look, this is a Fergana Valley, part of Central Asia. The borders are very, very complex. In some countries, like in Kyrgyzstan, you have Uzbek enclaves. It means Uzbek territories on the, surrounded by the territory of, of Kyrgyzstan. To make the issue more complicated, you can find such enclaves, Uzbek enclaves, in the territory of Kyrgyzstan where Tajiks are living. Not Uzbeks, not Kyrgyz, but Tajiks. <coughs> this is Tajik, like here. If you add if you consider the fact that these people had, in order to travel to Uzbekistan a few years ago, they had to have visas, the life of these people were very, very difficult. Borders. Borders are an issue in, in Central Asia. This is a picture from the border between Kyrgyz Republic and Uzbekistan in Karasu. This is a big market 
market where people in, on the side of Kyrgyz Republic, where people are selling Chinese goods. This is a Uzbek side. And here you see the uh, fence. There is no border. I mean, Uzbek authorities, they prevent trade with these uh, Chinese goods. They protect their markets. The, the situation changed. This is from the beginning of uh, 2002, I see in this picture. But we will return to this picture uh, in the middle of, of, of my presentation. So what we can say about, about these five countries? First of all, that there is a common Soviet legacy. I mean, there is this common legislation coming from the past. There is common way or of thinking, how people think, how people live in, in, in this region. There is common geography. All these five countries are landlocked. It means landlocked means that they don't have direct access to the sea. Uzbekistan is double landlocked country. It means that in order to come from Uzbekistan to the closest sea, you need to cross at least two other countries which is very difficult and uh, negatively affects uh, trade. Countries are similar, but there are also huge differences. Differences in size, for example. Kazakhstan, the size of Kazakhstan is, is uh, comparable with the size of Europe. Yeah? There are also two very small countries like Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. In Uzbekistan, there is more than 26 million people living there. In Kyrgyzstan and in uh, Tajikistan, there is uh, Turkmenistan, there is five, six, or maybe seven million people. So countries are different in, in size, population. They have also different resources. There, is, there are very rich countries like Kazakhstan with oil and gas reserves, Turkmenistan with gas and oil, Uzbekistan with everything, but this is another issue, and poor countries with like, Kar like Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, which do not have gas and oil, but they have water. And this is another very interesting issues, issue, which we will discuss uh, in a moment. So having different resources, <coughs> they have different incomes. There are rich countries, relatively rich countries, like Kazakhstan, let's say, and poor countries like Tajikistan. Countries have different economic systems. And of course, they have different interests in regional cooperation. Let's look on some numbers. Here, we have initial conditions. Conditions at the beginning of transition, at the beginning of 90s. Here, there are most recent data. It's not 2009, but 2006, 5, and 3. But these data are comparable from uh, similar sources. So if you look on GDP per capita at the beginning of transition, in most of the countries it was much higher than today. Only in Kazakhstan the, 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 the level the GDP per capita today is higher than it was in communist time. If you look on inequality, Gini index of income or consumption inequality, you can see that these values are higher everywhere. So in inequalities in Central Asia increase. Poverty. Poverty is common everywhere. Kazakhstan is the richest country in the region, but still poverty level is 21%. Poverty, uh, which is counted according to the poverty line to $15 per day. Yeah? In Tajikistan, you have 74%. It means Two third, uh, three fourths of population is living below poverty line. These are official data from the World Bank analysis. Even if relatively rich country like Turkmenistan, country is extremely rich with huge gas reserves, poverty is 44%. These data are a few years old, so maybe the, 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 the poverty rate is lower, but still is, now is lower, but still is. Uh, very, very high. What is the message from this? 
that several Central Asian countries are not very different than African countries. If you look on Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, these countries, if you look on GDP per capita in uh, uh, purchasing power parity terms, you can see that these countries are not different than Sudan. When we are talking about, about uh, development assistance, we, you are, you are, we are usually saying, yes, we need to help to Sub-Saharan Africa. Not only Sub-Saharan Africa is poor, also Central Asian countries, they need international assistance. Human Development Index. I don't know whether Sharbanu brief you about the, the, the concept, but Andre will talk about this tomorrow for sure. This is an aggregated index uh, which includes three components, GDP per, GDP per capita, life expectancy at birth, and adult, adult it literacy rate. And based on the combination of these three values, uh, there is a ranking of all countries in the world, published usually in the annex to uh, World uh, Global uh, Human Development Report. And most of the countries of Central Asia are placed in the second hundred of countries. Uh, Tajikistan is on the 122nd place out of 177 countries. The best is Kazakhstan, 73rd place. And usually when we are talking about this part of the world, we relate it to Russian Federation, which is 67, not very different from Kazakhstan, but still much, much better than other Central Asian countries. I mentioned geographical location. This is a huge disadvantage for Central Asian countries, which affect trade. The closest distance to the seaports is almost 4,000 kilometers. It affects time of trade and cost of trade. To the Black Sea is 3,000 kilometers. To the main market, one of the main markets of uh, Central Asian countries, European Union, the distance is 4,000 kilometers. If you compare with African, with landlocked African countries, these are distances from capitals of landlocked African countries to the sea, and these are distances of landlocked Central Asian countries to the sea. So the conditions in this part of the world are even worse than in African countries. Economic growth. At the beginning of transition, until 97, 98, there was economic decline. It means that economic conditions in each year in this part of the world were worse, worse, and worse. Only after 1999, situation changed. Countries started to grow. And this grow continued, continued until the last year. What will be this year, we will see. So what we observe, rapid economic recovery after 99, certain progress with the integration with the rest of the world, in the sense that Kyrgyzstan joined World Trade Organization in 1998. What are the benefits for these countries, for this country from World Trade Organization, from the, from the um, participation? This is another issue. The benefits are, are not very big, but still country show, to the, show to, the, to the rest of the world that we are open, we are democratic, we appreciate uh, world or global uh, rules of trade. We observed rapid growth, but rapid growth unfortunately based on energy and raw materials. Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan. Yeah, so situation improved, but in order to make it sustainable or to make it even better, there we need regional cooperation. We need regional cooperation. Countries need to cooperate between each other in order to grow faster, to trade between, between each other, and just to solve 
national and regional problems. Here we need to understand one issue. At the beginning of, of 90s, when countries, when the Soviet Union break down, where new countries were established, each country wanted to be different than neighbors, just to build their, their nation, their, their country. Yeah? And this process was necessary. They introduced different currencies. They introduced borders. They introduced visas, customs, uh, army in each country. This was very. This was very costly process. They built, they built borders, very strong borders, as you saw. But after ten or fifteen years, one should say stop. Let's cooperate. Let's try to be more open to each other. Let's trust each other. And because of it, every country can benefit. Uh, countries need to cooperate between each other in Central Asia, but also they need to be open for the cooperation with neighbors, for, with Russian Federation, with China, which is a huge market now, Iran, Afghanistan, and other countries. Why cooperation is needed? To promote trade and investment, to manage regional infrastructure, to manage water and energy nexus or mix if you want to manage environmental health and um, <laughs> other challenges we will be talking about this in the moment and to create more jobs for people not necessarily in one country but people could have possibility to migrate to find a job decent job in other countries about all these issues, we wrote in the Central Asian Human Development Report. This is the best human development report which you can ever find. <laughs> this is for sure. Of course, you can download it from the web as well. Now let's talk about selected issues, important issues for development of this region and for, for human development, in fact. Trade, transport and transit, water, energy, natural disasters, social challenges, and political constraints. So let's start shortly from trade, transport, and transit. Borders. As I said, borders is something new in this region. But these borders are difficult to cross, expensive. Expensive, expensive in the sense that people need to bribe these custom officers, uh, policemen, uh, soldiers, and so on. This Borders are time consuming. It takes time to cross borders and dangerous because there are no very, there is no very clear regulations. I mean, every person, every shuttle trader can be taken out from the car and asked to pay in different amounts for their businesses. It's all, it's dangerous and I mean, it's difficult to, to cross for trucks, for cars, for people. Customs are very often arbitrary, and as I, as I said, people are very corrupted. People are corrupted everywhere, in Africa, in Europe, in Central Asia, but in some regions are more corrupted than others. Uh, countries are ready to sign regional trade agreements or bilateral tra trade agreements. The problem is that they sign them, I cannot say hundreds, but dozens. There is a lot of trade agreements, and in some countries, people, they, they don't even know what they sign. And it's difficult to follow you know, all these agreements. I will show you the, the picture in a moment. Um, just to trade, there is, there is a need to build roads, to build, uh, to build uh, rails, and, and so on. Air transport. Air transport is underdeveloped in the region. Just to give you an example, to travel from Ashgabat to Bishkek. Ashgabat is a, a capital of Turkmenistan, and Bishkek, Bishkek is a capital of, uh, of uh, Kyrgyzstan. To, to travel from one country, to, uh, from one city to the other city, you, you need first to travel to Moscow, Istanbul, or Frankfurt. 
only from the last year. There is connection to Astana and once per week, Astana uh, or to Amati in Kazakhstan, and once per week there is a plane to, uh, to Ashgabat. So it's not, it's not easy and it's expensive. To travel from Dushanbe to, from, Tajikistan, from Tajikistan to Tashkent in Uzbekistan, neighboring countries, is also very difficult. There is no direct flight between these countries. At least one year ago there was no, no direct flight. So one needs to think how to make life of people better. As I said, transport is costly and time consuming. You have here a few numbers about cost of the transport by road, rail, rail and air transport. There are huge numbers. We will not go into details, but the message is it's expensive. It also takes a lot of time. If you, if you think that you can export, uh, I don't know, uh, grapes from Turkmenistan somewhere, and it takes 28 days to, to reach Europe, you, you should forget about this kind of business. <laughs> yeah. So, and this is a, this is a huge barrier for, for people, for, for, for businesses. This is a spaghetti ball of regional and trade agreements. So these are Central Asian countries, these countries signed agreements, different uh, regional trade agreements. They, they signed also bilateral uh, agreements with different countries. So as I said, it's as a spaghetti ball. It's difficult just to understand what's there. There is a lot of regional organizations, starting from Commonwealth of Independent States, Euroasis, Unified or Common Economic Space, Central Asian Cooperation Organization, Special, uh, special Program for, uh, for Economic Cooperation in Central Asia. This is uh, UN, United Nations uh, supported initiative. Economic Cooperation Organization, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So some of these organizations are getting stronger, some, one, some of them are, are dying, but still countries are members. But these different organizations, they have different members, and different members have different interests. So it's very difficult to coordinate. Right? Shuttle trade. Shuttle trade is very common. Shuttle traders are people which, you know, are traveling every second day to one country, buying uh, a little, uh, smuggling it to, to, to the other country, making small business. Very often illegal business, in the sense that they don't pay any uh, custom duties uh, and taxes. The problem is with shuttle trade is that these people, even if they don't pay custom duties, even if they don't pay taxes, they, do not, they are not doing this business just for fun or they don't do this business to, to become very rich. They do this business, <coughs> it's very hard to do this business, because they don't have other choice. Very often, women are involved in this kind of, of activities. Why? In order to buy food, clothes for their children. So we need to understand that this is something what exists, and the situation of shuttle traders is extremely bad. They can be stopped everywhere. They can be asked to pay money just in each, at each border. What we need to do with this? We need to think about good business climate and good governance. We need to, to, make, to make regulations very clear. We need to think about certain anti-corruption measures, about civil servants, transparency, accountability. Shuttle trade, once again. This is the picture which I described to you. Uzbek Kyrgyz border at, in 2002. This is the same place, the same place, but the picture was taken in May 2005. And, the, and as you see here, there is a bridge. This bridge were built by people, not by authorities, but by people. When? Just after so-called Andijan events. In Andijan, there were a lot of victims, there were a lot of people which were killed in the protests uh, against the authorities. So 
in other parts of the, of, the, of the country, situation was similar. But even it, if even it was dangerous for people, they decided to build this bridge in order to make these small businesses look to, 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 to carry some, I don't know, small things from one country to the other, just to live, just to live. So, trade once again. If countries open borders in Central Asia, this can give uh, huge opportunities for growth. Uh, Asian Development Bank estimated that open trade could increase uh, GDP in Central Asian countries up to 20% in big countries and even 50% in small countries like Kyrgyzstan, for example. And very often, this increase would have very positive result on poor people will benefit poor people. Water, energy, and environment. This is another very interesting issue. This, these are pictures of Aral Sea. You don't see the sea here. This is, a, <laughs> this is a desert. But a few years ago, there was a sea. And these ships were just using for fishing for businesses. Today, there is no sea in, 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 in the large part of, of, on the, of the area where a few years ago there was Aral Sea. In Karapakalstan, there is one city, Karapakalstan, a province of Uzbekistan, there is one city which was on the border of Aral, oh, sorry, on, on, the, on the coast of Aral Sea several years ago. Now, this city, is not on the sea anymore, but just guess what is the distance from this city to the sea. In other words, just guess what is the distance, how much this sea decreased in size. Just guess, is 10 kilometers, 15 kilometers, 100 kilometers? It's more than 200 kilometers. There is another problem. There is another problem because in this area, which was previously under the sea, there is a lot of salt and you cannot use this ground for agriculture. Huge area, just excluded from, from any economic activities. But this is not the end of the story. This is more, more related to environment than to water. Well, of course, kind of, these issues are very close here. But the problem with water in Central Asia is related to energy. There are upstream countries and downstream countries. Countries which are located in the mountains. Poor countries like Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. Countries which have only water, almost nothing else. And they use this water to produce electricity. And there are countries, downstream countries, like Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. And they need water, not for electricity, they need water for irrigation. Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, they need water during, for electricity during winter. But in order to produce the electricity during winter, they should allow water to flow down to, Kyrgyzstan, to Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. But these countries don't need water in the winter. They need water in the summer for irrigation. And there is very big conflict. conflict. Countries like Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, they are saying, OK, we can give you water during summer, although we don't need electricity. But you have to pay for this water as for electricity. Huh? Or you should compensate us with some oil or gas. Kyrgyzstan even approved a law which says that the water is, uh, is like oil, belongs to Kyrgyz nation, which is against international regulations, international law. But the country says that, that water in Central Asia should be considered like oil. We don't have oil, we have water. You want our water? Just pay for it. 
And this creates a lot of tensions in the countries. And water is, 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 is really like an oil. In Uzbekistan, for example, peasants, farmers, they have a graphic, they have a, they have a time schedule where they will get the water for irrigation of their, of their uh, fields, plants. And if, if they have water on Monday, five or six people are just walking there and back and looking whether no one is stealing this water from them. Because on Monday, the water should go to their plants. So this is a this is very, very, very important issue here. So, there, is, there are large water and energy resources. So a lot, there is a lot of water. Well, there is water in Central Asia. There is a lot of water in Kyrgyzstan, in Tajikistan. And there is a huge potential to produce energy and export energy, to produce energy from this water and export. But water and energy are linked. And also environment is present there. They are linked and these Different countries need, have different priorities, different interests. And this water energy nexus requires regional solution. But otherwise, countries like Uzbekistan will try to build a huge, huge uh, reserv reservoirs for, for, to store water, which cost billions of dollars. We can avoid this, making agreement between countries. But it's very difficult, and this problem is still not solved. <coughs> yeah. So this is what I said. I, 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 I said that, that some countries, they try to be self-sufficient in water and, en and energy, non-cooperate, and this is very costly. Very, very costly for the countries and for the region as well. How to solve it? There is a regional approach, but this regional approach requires some sharing of sovereignty. Other environmental issues. Central Asia is kind of a storage of radioactive and chemical materials from the communist time, uranium tiles and, and so on. One can ask, okay, why not to store this garbage in Central Asia? There are not non-populated areas, mountains. Well, why not to store there? The problem is that even if people are not directly affected by, by these uh, storages of, 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 of these uh, radioactive materials, environment may be hardly affected, affect, affected very much. Countries don't have money, they don't have resources to maintain these storages. And this is already not national, but international problems. UNDP is very deeply engaged in to support I mean, this kind of actions. All area, all the countries are located in very seismic area. So every day there could be an earthquake there. I'm quite often in Central Asia, often it means four, five, maybe six times per year. And I al already experienced earthquake in Tashkent. Nothing, nothing nice. Nothing nice, believe me. Well, in the past, in the past, uh, countries were, were affected by earthquakes very heavily. Tashkent is one of the examples in the 60s. Uh, Ashgabat in, in 40s, another example. Thousands of people were killed by earthquakes. So this is, this is a really a regional issue. If there is earthquake, the countries can lose a lot. Tajikistan, there is uh, estimates that Tajikistan can lose about 70% of GDP if earthquake happens. Similarly, Kyrgyzstan, not 70%, but 20, 25%. Kazakhstan, a, a, bit, a bit less. Uzbekistan, which is a huge country, less. Of course, you cannot compare with Armenia or Georgia from Caucasus, which these countries are even more affected by. Of course, if we, if we think about, about earthquakes, we can, 
we cannot do much, but we can think about some regional regional actions for preparedness for earthquakes or early uh, warning. Drugs, you know, where drugs are produced in Central Asia, in Afghanistan. And, and all this, um, and these drugs are mm, say, transported to key markets through Central Asia. From Afghanistan, through Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, to Russia and Europe. People, it's of course dangerous everywhere, but people are not doing it. This poor people are not doing it just to become rich. They are doing it because they don't have other choice very often. And of course, this problem of drugs is linked very closely with HIV/AIDS. This will be illustrated in the in the movie. Crime and terrorism always well, drugs. There is crime. To solve it, you, we need better institutions and better governance. Of course, not very much can be done in, in the region itself. The, 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 the key solutions lie outside the region, in the United States, in Europe, and so on. But still, but still there is a room for thinking and having this issue in mind. Social development. Let me start from labor migration. There are countries which are developing in Central Asia, which are developing very fast, like Kazakhstan. And Kazakhstan is a place where people from Central Asia are coming to work. They are coming to, Kyrgyz to Kazakhstan, they are coming to Russia. From where they are coming? They are coming from Tajikistan, which is the poorest country in, in the region. They are coming from Kyrgyzstan, they are coming from Uzbekistan. Uh, when you read about, about labor migration, uh, if you read economic analysis, you can find s different estimates that remittances or income from l sent by migrants to home countries is, let's say, 20, 50 percent of GDP. Or, like people say in Tajikistan, it's even 100% of, of GDP. In Armenia, it could be 70% of GDP. Is it good or bad? Hmm? Remittances, so big amount of remittances. Well, it's additional income which comes to, to the pockets of people. It can be spent on consumption. People in Kyrgyzstan, they say, we don't have problems with poverty anymore because we have money from our migrants. Money from remittances, they also help people to solve problems with poverty in Tajikistan. Yeah, so it's good. It's good. But what will be in the next year when countries which are usually the, 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 the uh, which usually need labor migrants like, like Kazakhstan or Russia will be affected by the crisis. They will not need migrants, labor migrants anymore. These people will have to come back home and they will not have any jobs. No one's waiting for them at home. This is one problem which can be observed next years. The other problem is with the human rights of, of labor migrants. You can see in well, people from CIS, they can see, uh, let's say, in Russian TV how uh, Russian police treats uh, migrants from uh, Azerbaijan or migrants from Tajikistan, illegal migrants. The, these people, they don't have any rights. Similarly, in, 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 Kyrgyz, in uh, Kazakhstan, they are usually working illeg illegal. Yeah? The, and there, need, there should be certain regulation. I mean, these issues need to be regulated somehow. The other issue is that there is a significant social cost of labor migration. People, usually men, are going to Kazakhstan or to Russia to work, 
and there are living their wives and children home. There are villages where there are only pensioners and women and children. It's, it's not healthy for this society. It's a source of huge conflicts and there are children which are traveling to Russian Federation to find their parents because both of them went there to earn money. These are huge problems which are very often neglected. Economists usually look on remittances and say oh, it's good, 100% of GDP in addition is fine. But we need also to think about social costs of labor migration. Life expectancy. At the beginning of transition, people in each country, in average, they lived longer. Now, life expectancy decreased in all the countries of Central Asia. Infant and under five mortality rates, these indicators, they also increased. So the situation is worse than before. Tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is a key health problem in the region not HIV AIDS, which is important of course, but tuberculosis. And if you compare the size of what has been at the beginning of transition, the situation which was uh, at the beginning of transition and which is now, you can see that in some countries it's much, much worse. This is a number of uh, cases for 100,000 of population, tuberculosis cases of 100,000 of population. Just for comparison, in Czech Republic is 12. Not 297, but just 12. So this is a problem for Tajikistan, a huge problem, tuberculosis. Education. Education. This is just dynamics of uh, secondary enrollment in Central Asia. You can see that the situation was worse and worse until the end of uh, the last decade of uh, the 2000, uh, of uh, 20th century. And then in different countries, either situation deteriorated further or improved slightly. If you look on higher education in Central Asia, here you have two patterns. One is Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, where the number of people enrolled in tertiary education or higher education increased. And the rest of the countries, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, well, in Tajikistan increased very little, but in Uzbekistan, for example, the number of students decreased significantly. Why? In these countries there are private universities. There is a plenty of private universities and the quality of education in these private universities is questionable. Roughly speaking, questionable. In Uzbekistan there is a different approach. The authorities are saying no, no private in universities because of the quality of education. We want to have less students but which are getting good, uh, good quality education. And this is why th this, in this country situation is worse. Turkmenistan is a special story. When we were writing this uh, uh, report, situation in this country with education was just disaster. There was no any PhD program in this country. So no one could obtain degree. In, in Turkmenistan. Students first attended uh, primary school 10 years like in, in, in Soviet Union. Then they had to work two years, just work as a gardeners, uh, drivers or whatever. And then they, ha they had opportunity to enter universities for three years. So would you like to go to the doctor which received such an education. The doctor, which was uh, two years driver and three years just studied medicine, it's a, it was a problem. The new president, which replaced Turkmen Bashi, the first, what he did, he changed the education system. Now it's much more civilized. Uh, this is what we are talking about. Other issues, other issues. If we are talking about cooperation, regional cooperation, we need, to, we need to have a common language. How people can communicate between each other. People in Kazakhstan, they speak Kazakh. 
in Turkmenistan, they speak Turkmen. In the past, they had Russian language, which was common in all the region, in all the countries of the region. Now, if you go to villages, people don't speak Russian. They understand, but they don't answer in Russian. So they are forgetting slowly, they are forgetting this language. Of course, these countries would like to be independent from Russian dominance. And it's okay, it's fine. In Kazakhstan, people should, should speak Kazakh. We don't have any objections. But if we want, if we want, if, if we want to support regional cooperation, not on very high level, but on, on small level, cooperation between people, between shuttle traders, if they want to make business in other country, they need to know the language. Of course, it would be the best if people in Central Asia could speak English. But we will wait 100 years, or maybe more, until they learn English in villages. But now, still, they have Russian. And this language should be a second language in each country, kind of a second language. In Kyrgyzstan, for example, these two languages are equal. Any law, any official document is, is printed on the page, which is divided into parts. One is in Kyrgyz, second one is in Russian. In other countries, like in Uzbekistan, all regulations are prepared, drafts, are prepared in Russian. But then the final version is published in Uzbek. In Kazakhstan, everything is, is in Kazakh. There are different reasons for this, but you can discuss it with your colleagues in, in, in the break. So our view is that, that countries should have their national languages, people should speak in these national languages, but still we need to keep this Russian language as a mean for communication between countries. Internet access. In all countries of Central Asia, probably except Turkmenistan, there is more or less free access to internet. In some countries it's expensive, but, but uh, there are no, no any, let's say, um, barriers. In Turkmenistan, this, this is underdeveloped. People don't have access. Even if, even if in, in, in government, in governmental institutes, they have computers, but they don't have access to the internet. They should have. Gender issues. In the presence of Sharbanu, I will not <laughs> go deeply to this, to this topic. Gender issues and the uh, situation of women is an issue in the region, and this will be illustrated in the, in the documentary. And we need to have in mind this, that the situation of women in Islamic countries needs to be taken into account. Political and institutional constraints, very quickly. Usually, when we say, when we discuss regional cooperation, we can see that there is a lot of international agreements in Central Asia signed by presidents. Everybody is ready to sign the new agreement about cooperation in the, in the region. Presidents are always willing to sign it. The only problem in Central Asia is that nothing happens after. And we usually say there is no political will for regional cooperation. But it's not about political will. This is about interest of, of people which are in the governments, in influential people. There are, there are big groups of people which are gaining from non-cooperation, from monopolistic mar markets, from closed borders, and so on. Trying to solve these problems, we need to think about these people which are gaining from non-cooperation and which are benefiting from cooperation. Usually people which are gaining from non-cooperation, they are much better organized and much more influential. And this is why there is no really uh, progress in this, in this area. Conclusions and recommendations. Just a few conclusions. Very, very shortly. Uh, biggest gains, biggest gains can, can, ca can come from trade, transport, and transit. 
there were certain estimations saying uh, about this. Water and energy issue. This issue could be also very beneficial, uh, beneficial for all the countries of the region. The biggest threats, natural disasters, earthquakes, floods, and so on, communi communicable diseases, and regional conflicts. Water energy nexus can lead, and crisis, economic crisis, can lead to the conflicts in the region. This should be taken into account. Domestic reforms, reforms. I mean, if we, were, if we are talking about the development in general, good gover governance is necessary. Investment climate. If foreign investors, people from the West, if they want to invest in Uzbekistan, they have very little idea about the country. What they know is, is the region. And if there is something wrong in Tajikistan, kind of, uh, I don't know, national uh, conflicts or something like that, no one will invest in Uzbekistan. So the investment climate is already a regional issue. Social, envir especially environmental policies, they, they need to be coordinated regionally. Recommendations. If we want to support regional cooperation, we need to, um, to support networking between governments, business, academia, civil society. This exchange of people or contacts of civil society, people from civil society, academicians between, each, uh, be between countries, they can build trust. If people don't know each other personally, they think about uh, people from different countries in very abstract terms. If they know people by face, they think about people. And this is very important for, for cooperation and building trust for cooperation. National development strategies. Each country develops national development strategies. But there is very little about regional dimensions in these strategies very, very little. Usually people and governments concentrate and focus only on national actions. Uh, regional institutions, there is a lot of, uh, you, you saw on the, on, on the, on the slide, there are several regional institutions and these institutions should be strengthened first of all and should have very clear mandates. International communities should help countries to cooperate. Um, yeah, should support regional cooperation. What we, what we want, we want to, we don't call for, let's say, cancelling borders in Central Asia. These borders will exist, but we would like to see the borders with human face, where people are well treated, like in Europe, where borders which are easy to cross, which are not dangerous, which are nice. Uh, and last, last moment, domestic reforms. Domestic reforms, good governance, invest, investment climate, economic reforms. All these reforms can support regional cooperation and life of people. First of all, thank you for this uh, presentation. You were talking about the, uh, some enclaves, in uh, uh, Uzbek enclaves uh, located in the Fergana Valley in, Uzbe in Kyrgyzstan. Yeah. And uh, you um, have given uh, the uh, statement that the, the only Tajik ethnicity lives there. But I can argue is that here that the, some Uzbek residents, uh, Uzbek ethnicity also living in the, this enclave. So it's my uh, kind of first note, uh, which I have uh, taken. Um, and Tajik ethnicity also uh, counted as a Uzbek resident, actually, Uzbek passport holders, even, let me, even if they are let, let, me, let me answer yes. just one by one, OK? Because, sure. ah, okay. because this is the this is, uh, wrong message, I mean. Because I said, there are enclaves, Uzbek territories on, in Kyrgyzstan, but in some of them, not even Uzbeks are living, but Tajiks. And this 
why I said this? Because once I was on, the, on such a meeting, on the training, and I'm asking why the, the, the room is empty. Because people from Enclave should come, and they are late. Okay. They came, 20 people, and then I discovered that they don't speak Uzbek. I said, well, they're coming from Uzbek Enclave. Why they don't speak Uzbek? Because they're Tajik. Okay, there might be a... This is, was just example, maybe. illustration of the complex ethnic issues okay, in the region. Water is not a resource which, like oil which belongs to the country, even if it's written in Kyrgyz constitution. Okay, there is international law. Just to make it clear, right? Second, second, yes, Tajikistan has problems with electricity. I agree. I also agree with the fact that the issue of uh, the problem of RLC is discussed last 20 years. And there are huge international money coming and every, uh, to, to solve this problem. And every country wants to solve this problem. The problem is that it's probably too late. And, it's, and, and there is no real impact of this. <clears throat> I said, Tajikistan has problems with electricity. It's true. But on the other hand, it has huge potential to produce hydropower. Uh, yeah, thank you. Well, this is, uh, this is very interesting from the discussion because I also come from Central Asia, but I've come from Kazakhstan. And I, I don't want to sort of comment on the fa factual pa part of your presentation, but uh, I was about to ask a question, how do you see, but now I think it's very obvious that Central Asia, in fact, is a very complex region. And in a way, for me, when, the, when in your presentation it was clear, sort of uh, red line uh, coming through the whole presentation that regional cooperation is going to help everybody in a way so uh, Central Asia is considered as one region, it's not only geographically, but of course uh, every, my, my colleagues from Central Asia would agree, of course we share a lot of not only territory but like border, we have history, we have common, in a way, much more closer, of course, cultural uh, uh, traditions, but uh, still my point is that you can see now um, that S Central Asia is very, very diverse in the countries, I mean, you 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 can argue, of course, that uh, some of the of some some of the uh, sort of uh, characteristics are very similar. But my my point is that y you cannot compare the same you know a, uh, approach to social development in Kazakhstan with Kyrgyzstan or Tajikistan. This is where I think international donors uh, sometimes make kind of you know too much generalization in a way. And also, when you talk about regional cooperation and about failures of regional cooperation, um, and there are many, of course, you said lack of political will, but of course, you can see now that many like uh, close borders between Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan, or uh, sorry, Uzbekistan, or between Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, actually, we have a lot of you know, dispute, border disputes, and it is very political motivated. And also, we have to take into account that at uh, political regime in Turkmenistan, which has changed recently, hopefully it will come better, but improved, but uh, Uzbekistan is still very much close uh, country. And you, in a way, when you compare the human rights sort of record, even my country, of course, I don't say all Uzbekistan, but we talk about Andijan events, and the political attitude of the international community was very kind of, it was very convenient, in a way, when the American government has had a base, a military base in Uzbekistan. Nobody really talked about human rights in Uzbekistan until recently when the Andijan uh, happened and actually when the base was withdrawn from Uzbekistan. So I'm saying that in Central Asia, geopolitically, there are many interests. Russia, and I can argue in a way maybe for Kazakhstan, uh, with all my respect to Central Asia, perhaps it is more kind of in terms of strategic direction, uh, it's better to sort of develop more cooperation with Russia and China uh, in terms of economic and social also impact. Whereas we understand that it can have sort of spillover effect. Now when you talk about open trade, uh, we experience very much because we've done quite a huge uh, economic growth over recent days or five years. Um, our government and our uh, private business invested a lot of money in Georgia in Caucasus, in, 
Kyrgyzstan, and it had a lot of uh, positive impact. But now, when because of financial crisis, because the level of refinancing actually in Kazakhstan, I was surprised it was not there because it's also very high. External debt of Kazakhstan, now we're actually in trouble. And it's going to have, uh, of course, negative impacts on labor migrants from uh, Kyrgyzstan, from Uzbekistan. But at the same time, I mean, they, they, they certainly different trajectories. And I don't, you know, in a way, I don't always agree with this kind of formula that for development of Central Asia, regional cooperation is the only kind of, you know, ultimate goal. In general, I agree with all your points. Countries are different, very different. Uh, some of countries are more open, some of the countries are less open. There are countries which are ready to cooperate, which is Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. These country, countries are ready for cooperation. Other countries like Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan, today, they are not ready to cooperate with in Central Asia. This is one point. In the report, we said, let's think about cooperation with Central Asia, but uh, we need to take in this into account, that there are countries, three countries, which could, be, uh, which could form the, the nucleus of our, uh, regional cooperation. And the other countries, seeing the, the, the benefits, could join later on. This is one point. Second point, in the report we wrote, countries should cooperate with all the world, should join World Trade Organization. This is the first best solution for Central Asian countries. This is a very important point. We are not saying just build borders around Central Asia, don't cooperate with China, don't cooperate with Russia. No, Central Asia is it's a neighbor of Russia. Russia is the biggest market. You cannot think about development of this region not taking into account Russia and political interests of Russia there. Yeah? So we are not saying this. We are saying be open for the, all, for the whole world. Cooperate with Iran, with, with China. Cooperate with, with, with Russia. Not only in Central Asia. This is a very important conceptual pro uh, 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 problem related to trade. Because if countries form a regional block for trade, only Central Asian countries, these countries, there will not be a spillover of new technologies, for example. These countries will just produce old-fashioned old goods. But, but in general, I, I agree with, with your point. I have just kind of like a comment um, about uh, the way you presented your data. Uh, so it's kind of like, aside from those political and you know, uh, discussion, I didn't quite agree, or maybe I didn't quite like the quote that you had about the shuttle business. And I don't know whether, uh, you know, um, you know, my colleagues from the countries that are familiar with that uh, agree or disagree. But the way you presented it uh, is that it's something good. Well, in a way, it is because it lets people survive. But you kind of encouraged it. You were talking about those people who are involved in that shuttle business as, you know, uh, you know, good people providing for you know their families and suffering from all those re regulations, and that's why uh, you know, and they're very concerned about sad eyes of the parents. But um, I don't know. I just felt that maybe you should have also included a quote uh, from those parents in Russia or you know um, in, from those. Central Asian republics suffering because um, I believe it's not about the sad eyes that those people are concerned, but about their own profit and their own uh, just money. So I just kind of felt that that presenting just one quote was a little bit kind of one-sided. There are thousands of people doing this business, and they are not doing it for fun, but they do do this because they don't have other jobs. And what we want, we want them to be well treated in the borders that because today they don't have any rights they 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 ask to bribe you know everybody there I mean, they, it's not fun it's i don't know whether you saw this these are businessmen they are not they are not not shuttle traders shuttle trader is is, is a person who, who has a small bag with with some peanuts inside you know oh two bags sorry two bags yes.